Many thanks for this opportunity to talk about the spiritual fragrance of Islam. I'd like to start by answering this question, which is often asked, a Muslim spiritual aspirant, where does he or she get this wisdom and guidance? In Islam, there are four sources. The first source is the Quran, the holy book of Muslims. The second source is what is called Hadith. And this refers to the collected sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and observation of his behavior. The third one is insights from the jurists and the sages, the mystics who abound in Islam. And the fourth one is what is called individual understanding. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad famously said, consult your heart, consult your heart. And the heart is mentioned 132 times in the Quran. So let me start with the Quran, which literally means recitation. It has its origin in a, in a very phenomenal spiritual event that occurred in the year 610. CE, when the Prophet Muhammad was meditating in the caves in Mecca, and on this particular day, it was in the month of Ramadan, we know that, the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar, when early in the morning as the Prophet was meditating in a retreat for 40 days and nights, he saw this huge light approaching him. And the Prophet got scared, and the light had a voice. It said, I am Angel Gabriel. And it had a command, Iqra, meaning recite, say something. And by this time, Muhammad was his name, who became a prophet after this spiritual phenomena, was perspiring, very, very petrified with fear. He ran down the mountain into the arms of his beloved wife, Khadija, saying, I'm going crazy, I've gone mad, I'm hallucinating. And his beloved wife assured him that he is the most sane person she knows. She wrapped him in a blanket, and then she ran over to confer with a distant cousin who was blind, but who was a seer, and who was a Christian, Waraka. She said, Waraka, Waraka, tell me what's happening. Go into a trance. And Waraka then said, your husband is going to become a prophet. Please go back and persuade him to return to the mountain. And she did. And she was able to persuade him. And Muhammad, thinking his hallucination is over, went back to the cave in Mecca. But once again, this light, Angel Gabriel, Ikra, recite, say something. And this time, Muhammad, who became a prophet after this incident, had a feeling of deep squeezing, a deep pain inside of him, and from the depths of his soul poured out these words of exquisite beauty, which were seared into his soul. The first words, the first revelation of the Quran. And this happened for 23 years. Sometimes in response to a question, sometimes unpredictably. When asked, how did you know it was coming? He, he would say, I hear the buzzing of bees or the chiming of bells. It was never pleasant. It was difficult, painful. And the collection of these utterances is called the Quran because his family members, his followers, companions would write them down on the bark of trees and parchments and stones, and they put them together. What is astonishing about the collection of these revelations is that there is no body of Arabic literature in the past or today 
that comes even close to the language of the Quran, the cadence, the rhythm, the juxtaposition of words. And this is considered a miracle in Islam. And everybody agrees whether uh, you know it's an academician who does not like Islam or likes Islam saying the language is just extraordinary, incredible. So the Quran is a sonoral revelation with the vibrations have a deep effect on the body and the soul even before it reaches the mind. One more point uh, about the Quran I need to add here that like any holy book, the Quran has two kinds of verses, particular and universal. Particular verses are in desperate need of historical and textual context. Universal verses are timeless, placeless, and filled with wisdom. So today I shall be focusing on the universal verses. The problem with this is if I take a particular verse and advocate that as a universal verse, that is a problem. Or if I take a particular verse from my holy book and compare that to a universal verse from another holy book, it's an unfair comparison. So my friends, the second source is called the Hadith, the collection of the Prophet's sayings, observation of his behavior, and unfortunately, a lot of them are fabricated. So spiritual Muslims say, choose those Hadith that are in conformity with the, the values, the principles, the spirit of the Quran. The third one is, I said, jurists and sages. You know, in the Quran, Allah says that the human being was molded from water and clay, and then Allah infused that water and clay with God's breath, and then asked the angels to bow to the human. So noble is this creation of the human being. At, at first the angels objected, and then God said, you do not know what I know. I have placed the names of all things in the human. I say this because, as the Quran says, the human being can rise to the highest of the high, even higher than the angels, and also sink to the lowest of the low. Which is why there's so many sages in Islam who go deep into mysticism and the incredible innate potential within every single human being. You know, Rumi has this wonderful, this 13th century sage, this wonderful utterance. Rumi says about the human being, you are a ruby in the midst of granite. You are a ruby in the midst of granite. How long will you continue to deceive us? For we can see the look in your eyes. So please return to the root of the root of your true, authentic self. The last one I said was individual understanding, consult your heart. The Prophet Muhammad famously said, no matter what the religious judge tells you, no matter what the experts tell you, pundits tell you, always consult your heart. Consult your heart. He would repeat it again and again and again. And that's why sages say, if you consult your heart, if your heart is pure, and you look for answers inside your heart, I love that 
mystical phrase, you can hear bird song in the egg. You can hear bird song in the egg. Again, the mystics say, you know, all, all the theologies of the world are as nothing compared to one whisper of the beloved in your heart. So now, I'd like to just say a few words about this confusion among non-Muslims. Who are the Sufis? Even among Muslims, who are the Sufis? Like many people tell me, Jamal, you're a nice guy. But that's because you're not a Muslim, you're a Sufi. Well, who is a Sufi? Sufi is simply someone, a Muslim, who is focused not on the details of the theology, the rituals, the rigidity of beliefs, but is focused on simply living the spirit of the tradition. You see, in Islam, the two main denominations, like in Christianity, Catholics and Protestants, in Islam, we have Sunni and Shia. How did this happen? It did not exist in the time of Prophet Muhammad, but when he died in 632 CE, the question arose, who would succeed him? Not as a prophet, but as a community leader. And one group said, it's simple, it should be by consensus. Another group said, well, that's beautiful, but don't forget, we've had a prophet in our midst. It should be by blood lineage. The ones who said blood lineage, they call Shia. The ones who said by consensus are Sunnis. Today, it doesn't matter because at that time, it was a small, embryonic, struggling community. Today, there are over, over 55, close to 60 majority Muslim countries. But that historical dispute and one subsequent event in 680, the Battle of Karbala, where the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad and his entire family was slain, killed by an opposing Sunni army. And this has caused a huge wound and deepened this pain which arose from this historical dispute of who will become the community leader. And by the way, in the Islamic world, 85% of Muslims are Sunnis, 15%, one five, are Shia. And the major difference is this bifurcation because of this historical dispute. Sufis, as I mentioned before, they can be a Sunni or a Shia, or even, this is another confusion of any religion. I said they're a Muslim, but what does a Muslim literally mean? One who has surrendered to God. So let me give you an example of the difference between a say, conservative Muslim and a Sufi. A conservative Muslim might say that, Jamal, if you don't do your obligatory five prayers, you will burn in hell. Terrible punishment awaits you. But a Sufi will say, Jamal, if you don't do your prayers, it is as if you're missing out on a celestial feast. Because when you pray, it is as if you are attending a celestial feast. And if you don't pray, you're missing out on the party. That is your punishment. So a total different way of approaching. So just to summarize, 
the four sources of guidance, of wisdom for the spiritual aspirant for a Muslim is the Quran, Hadith, the insights and sayings of jurists and sages. And the fourth one is individual understanding. Consult your heart. So just be with that for a few moments. You might not know that I work with a rabbi and a pastor ever since 9-11. We've become good friends. We're called the Interfaith Amigos. And we've made hundreds of presentations all over the country, even overseas. And we always start by talking about what are the core teachings or what is the core teaching in my tradition? We have core teachings between uh, all world religions, in this case, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, that overlap. But maybe there is one core teaching that is emphasized more deeply. So my, my rabbi brother says, in Judaism, it's oneness, oneness. My Christian brother says, it's unconditional love. And I say it's compassion as a Muslim. The Prophet Muhammad said, the entire spiritual wisdom of Islam is contained in the Quran. And the entire wisdom of the Quran is contained in the first chapter of the Quran called Surah Fatiha. And the entire wisdom of that one chapter is contained in the invocation which opens virtually every one of the 114 chapters of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Meaning, in the name of God, who is boundlessly compassionate, infinitely merciful. So, a Bedouin once asked the Prophet Muhammad, what is the secret? to this invocation called the Basmallah, Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, in the name of God, boundlessly compassionate, infinitely merciful. And the Prophet Muhammad said, this is the message, this is the secret. If you want to be content, fulfilled in life, be compassionate with yourself and be compassionate with others. This is the key. So I teach many classes on what does it mean? And how do you do this? What are some practices to be gentle, merciful, compassionate with yourself? What does it mean to be compassionate with God's creation? You know, all the Islamic spiritual teachers, they're very eager to explain the beauty, the majesty, the power of this divine vibration, compassion, gentleness, mercy. And like in other traditions, they use the metaphor of water to explain this. There is nothing as soft and yielding as water is. And yet, for overcoming the hardest, the most insurmountable, there's nothing as powerful as water is. Meaning, the person who is gentle, compassionate, kind, is possessed of raw, authentic strength. And there's more. In the Quran, it says, every living thing is created out of water. Wherever water falls, life flourishes. Wherever water falls, life flourishes. Meaning, the person who is gentle, compassionate, kind, is also, besides being possessed of authentic, genuine strength, is also life-bestowing, life-affirming. You know, I love the insight of the utterance of Rumi who says about compassion, how should spring 
bring forth a garden on hard stone. How should spring bring forth a garden on hard stone? Become earth. Become earth. So you may grow flowers of many colors. For you, Jamal, you have been a heart-breaking rock. You have been a heart-breaking rock just once, just once for the sake of experiment. Become earth. You know, I'm a Bengali and I love the poetry of Rabindranath Tagore. If I remember, his, his, there's one line, he says, not hammer strokes, not hammer strokes, but the gentle dance of the waters sings the pebbles into perfection. Not hammer strokes, but the gentle dance of the waters sings the pebbles into perfection. Okay, just be with that for a few moments. You know, I love the saying of uh, the Islamic mystics who say, you know, be still and whatever has been said, allow that to perfume your heart before rushing ahead. And, and take note of what has been said and whatever, I'm quoting Ruby now, whatever splashes in your heart, take note of that and go deep with that. Okay, so now I want to talk about the three principles of Islam and the five pillars, but from a spiritual perspective. What is the first principle of Islam? It is Islam itself. And what does the word Islam mean? Islam literally means to surrender in peace to submit, to surrender in peace. But the question is, what are you surrendering? And the Quran suggests what you're surrendering is your attachment to your ego, called the nafs in the Quran, so that, as the Holy Book says, you can bring a heart turned in devotion to God. And who is a Muslim? Someone who is surrendered to God. Essentially, the Islamic mystics say is that you're being asked to become a seeker. Because what does it mean to surrender your attachment to your ego? The Islamic mystics say it's about a divine exchange over a lifetime, every day, every week, every month, every hour, making the exertion, the effort, the struggle to bring divinity and not your ego into the center of your life. We need the ego, but it becomes like a commanding master. We want to bring divinity in the center of our life. This is called the divine exchange. And the Quran suggests, you know, we don't become a seeker because it's very inconvenient. It's hard work. So Rumi, he says, there are two veils, two obstacles that stand in the way of you, Jamal, becoming a seeker. Not for everybody, but for most of us because we are unmindful. And what are those two veils? Health and wealth. When my health is good, or those of my loved ones, or I have wealth, not just money, but also emotional security, all this talk about the divine exchange, transforming your ego, opening up your heart, becoming spiritual is not only irrelevant but very inconvenient until there's a crisis as is bound to be 
death in the family, cancer, health issues, change of circumstances, and then suddenly deeper questions. What is going on? Why me? But the question the Quran is waiting to listen to is this insight within me which emerges, I need help. I need help from a source greater than a human personality, greater than a human institution. And the Quran says, welcome. And the verse in the Quran says, say, this emerges from within you. You understand this, this verse that say, my life, my living, my prayers, my sacrifice, are all for you, my sustainer. So in my classes, I often ask, In the timeline of your life, what were some events that made you a seeker? It could be a number of events or it could be a singular event. It doesn't have to be said, it can be something very joyous. But usually, as I said, because we are unmindful, it often is a crisis. So in my own life, for example, in 1991, my mother died unexpectedly and in 20 days my father passed away because they were very close as a couple of a heart attack actually of really of a broken heart and it woke me up i remembered that uh, verse from hafiz something missing in my heart tonight something missing in my heart tonight has made my eyes so soft, my voice so tender, my need for God absolutely clear. I had read that so many times, but for the first time, I moved from a knowledge of the tongue to a knowledge of the heart about these lines, about these words, about the vibrations, meanings, what it was conveying, something missing in my heart tonight has made my eyes so soft my voice so tender my need for god absolutely clear so the quran it attempts to encourage us to make this divine exchange the quran says say what has seduced you away from your most generous instructor Another verse in the Quran says, Please sell not your bond with God for so paltry a price. Do not sell your bond with God for so paltry a price. I, I love the words of the Islamic sages. You know, I'll quote Rumi again, who meditates on this verse in the Quran where it says, you know, where will you find a, a provider like God? Allah is the best of providers. And Rumi, who did not write but would go into a trance, he, he uttered, where will you find a customer like God who pays in gold? Jamal, where will you find a customer like God who pays in gold, who accepts your counterfeit coins who accepts your counterfeit coins and buys your dirty shabby bag of goods and in return gives a spiritual spring so delicious that even sugar is jealous of its sweetness where will you find a customer like god who pays in gold who jamal accepts your counterfeit coins who buys your dirty, shabby bag of goods and in return gives a spiritual spring so delicious that even sugar is jealous of its sweetness. And Rumi goes on, for God's sake, for your sake, sell and buy at once. Where will you find a market like this? For one weak breath, the divine breath, for one little seed, the entire rose garden. So again, 
Let's sit with that for a little bit. This work of the divine exchange. That's the real meaning of Islam in a spiritual sense. The second principle is called Iman or faith. Can I build faith? Primarily in God, in something we cannot quantify, cannot see, it's invisible. Call it higher intelligence, divinity, some don't like the word God, call it a divine principle, a divine attribute like love, compassion, oneness, justice, service. And the Islamic mystics say to build faith, to grow faith, you have to move from borrowed certainty to inner knowing. It's a process. It's experiential. It has to grow from within. And so the Quran says there are three stages. The first stage is hearsay. Ilmul yaqeen. The second stage is have experiences in life. You make mistakes, you grow from it. Don't make an excuse not to have experiences. You know, there's a, a true story of a disciple who goes to his sheikh and says, Sheikh, I'm so grateful I've studied with you because your teachings have taught me so much. Before now, I plunge into something. Before I do something, I think not once, not twice. I think three times. And what did the master say? Once is enough. Have that experience. Don't make an excuse. The third stage is Haq al yaqeen It has to be something which emerges from within. You know, here I'd like to introduce to you a, a wonderful character in Islamic spirituality, a fictional character, Mullah Nasruddin. Some say started in the 13th century, has a beard, is a middle-aged person, has a turban, is a village idiot and a sage rolled into one who loves to laugh at himself. And through his laughter, through his insights, through his wisdom, is conveying many profound truths. So here is a story of someone knocking on the mullah's door and the mullah opens the door, he's delighted, it's his friend who has brought with him some wild ducks which he has hunted. And together they make a beautiful large pot of duck soup, very delicious. But second day, third day, there's a knock on the door, I'm a friend of the friend who brought you the duck soup. And you know, the rules of hospitality, the mullah brings duck soup. Happens a third time, fourth time, fifth time. I'm a friend of the friend of the friend of the friend who, who, who got you the duck. On the tenth day, I'm a friend of the friend of the friend. And this time the mullah is very annoyed. He has the guest seated. He goes in the kitchen. And he brings this pot of soup. Actually, it's just hot water. And the guest is very excited. Takes a spoon, puts, uh, cups the water, or cups the he thinks it's a soup, drinks it, says, this is no soup, of the, this is no duck soup. And the mullah says, yes, this is the soup of the soup of the soup of the soup of the soup. How does it relate to faith? Quite often, my faith is a soup of the soup of the soup of the soup of somebody else's belief or hearsay. Okay. Now we move on to what is called the third principle, Ihsan. Very important, very critical. It's about doing 
something I want to avoid. What is that? The inner inconvenient work of becoming an insane kamil, meaning a more perfected, a more evolved, a more developed human being. It's about inner work. So let me again share a story. As you can see, I love stories. I love poetry because in my training, I was given a, a verse from the Quran coupled with a teaching story or a hadith or poetry from Rumi, Hafez, Rabia. So here's a story of Rabia, a most beloved female sage in Islam, 8th century, 9th century. This is a story I know you've heard because it's gone all over the world. It comes in different forms. So Rabia, she's from Iraq, and in those days, no electricity, but they used to have pillars with fire on top. And she's one day looking for the lost key. And because Rabia is so famous, uh, people from the village, they join in the search. And finally, after some time, this person says, beloved Rabia, can you kind of tell us where you might have dropped it so we can better focus our search? And Rabia says, actually, I did not lose my key here. I lost my key miles away in my house over there. And the puzzled villagers say, but Rabia, then why are you looking for it here? She said, simple, my house has no light at all, but here there's so much more light. And of course they all laugh. And then now she says, ah, you have laughed, which tells me you are intelligent people. But now you tell me, when you have lost, your happiness, your peace of mind, your contentment because of a lost relationship out there that didn't work out or a plan that didn't materialize or some circumstances changed. Did you lose it out there? Yes, of course you did. But where you really lost it is inside you. But of course, it's much more dim, much more inconvenient to make that search. And that struck a chord in the hearts and minds of the villagers. This external work is important, but critical is the work of what is called the inner inconvenient work. So what is the inner inconvenient work? Let's pause it for a few moments. What is it exactly? So this is a subject that Sufis will focus on, will focus very deeply. To summarize, it's about transforming the ego from a commanding master into a personal assistant. I repeat, it's about the lifelong work of transforming the ego from a commanding master into a personal assistant. And the second very important work is to purify and open the heart. The heart is mentioned 132 times in the Quran. So let me start with the first one, transforming the ego. The Quran mentions three stages of the ego. In the first stage, the ego is like a commanding master. It can lead you astray. You have to be vigilant. Observe it. Make it a personal assistant. The second stage again, like faith, is have experiences in life. You'll find out you have a conscience. You made a mistake, you grow from it. But have those life experiences. And the third stage is where you have made a lifelong commitment that every hour, every week, every day, every month, you will align your personality 
to your higher self. What is a personality? I like best the quotation of the Buddha who says, the personality is nothing more than a bundle of conditioned reactions to life's circumstances. Nothing more than a bundle of conditioned reactions to life's circumstances. Can I align my personality every day to come closer and closer in alignment with my higher self, my Allah nature, Elohim nature, Krishna nature, Buddha nature. Rumi has this wonderful poetry, marry your soul, that wedding is the way. Marry your soul, that wedding is the way. So it requires what Sufis call compassionate self-witnessing. And the key is it has to be compassionate. That is what will make the ego relent. If I use reason, it will come up with even more beguiling reasons. If I use force, even willpower, which is very beautiful, it will come up with imagination. Ah, but compassion, compassionate self-witnessing, shine the light of compassionate self-awareness and that will dissolve the shadows. And to help us, who comes to the rescue but the fictional Mullah Nasruddin? So in my training, I was asked to meditate on story after story of the story of Mullah Nasruddin. Here's one story. It's a moonlit night. And the Mullah is out on his constitutional walk. He happens to pass by a well. He, he peers down. He looks inside. He is horrified. Why? The moon has fallen into the well. Sister Moon, fear not, fear not. He rushes home, gets a rope, ties a hook. He flings it inside the well. It catches something. He heaves and pulls and heaves and pulls. Something comes loose. And he falls on his back and sees the moon restored to its proper domain. And he says, thank God I came along. What is this about? And I was asked to meditate on that for days and weeks. Essentially, it's about understanding that the, our ego has a very exaggerated opinion about itself. Here's a favorite one, which uh, I and the Intervet Amigos, we present wherever we go. Uh, the mullah goes to work, lunchtime, opens his lunch pail box. What does he find? A cheese sandwich. But second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, it's always a lousy cheese sandwich. On the tenth day, the mullah says, I'm getting sick and tired of this lousy cheese sandwich. So his puzzle co-worker says, mullah, why don't you ask your wife, be gentle, be persuasive. Ask her to make you a different kind of sandwich. The mullah says, I'm not married. Who makes them? The mullah says, I do. <laughs> this is a question. This is a story about how we get stuck into our patterns and we, bl we blame bad luck, bad circumstances in life. Bl I blame you. But I don't look at my own pattern, the real cause. Let me give you one more. Because I was asked to ponder on this very greatly meaning for a long time. It's about a slavish dependence on pundits, experts, authorities. The mullah is gravely ill. His wife is crying and lamenting and now in comes the expert, the authority. Who is that? The allopathic medical doctor who examines the mullah at length, turns to the wife and says, Oh, honorable wife of the mullah, only Allah is immortal. I'm so sorry to tell you. Your husband's soul has 
flow into the bosom of God. But the mullah is not dead. The mullah is not dead. He's quietly saying and feebly saying, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. And what does the wife say? Quiet, don't argue with the doctor. So all this is meant to inform us, let us know, make us aware in a compassionate way about the foibles of the ego and by shining the light of awareness, self-witnessing compassionately, it begins to diminish it. Okay, let's move on. The heart. The Quran says, you have to purify your heart. The Quran says, if you have a negative thought, evil deed, this creates a rust on your heart. And the Prophet Muhammad said, for every rust, there is a polish. And the polish for the rust of the heart is remembrance of God. And what is remembrance of God? It's about, the great mystics say, using God solvents to polish the heart, to remove the rust, the stain. God solvents like love, compassion, forgiveness, service. And the Quran says, bring to God a sound heart. Everything we have is from God. What can we offer God? Nothing but a polished heart. So that when you return, Allah's face is reflected in that polished heart. Ah, but it's not easy. Again, the mystics say, Jamal, if you get irritated by every rub, how will the mirror of your heart ever be polished? If you get irritated by every rub, how will the mirror of your heart ever be polished? And the Quran says, open your heart. Of course, by, through purifying it, the heart opens. You know, this is a famous saying, understand the nature of purity. Jamal, if your key is crooked, if your key is crooked, it will not fit the lock. It won't open the door of your heart. It reminds me of this another verse from the Islamic mystics. Close down speech's door and open the window of your heart. Or open the door of your heart. The moon will kiss you only through the window, through that door. So yes, purify it. But another very important way in Islamic spirituality to open your heart is to embrace not only your 10,000 joys of life, but also your 10,000 sorrows of life. The Quran says, all feelings come from divinity. All feelings, your laughter, your tears, your joys, your sorrows, they all come from God. They're all sacred. In my difficult feeling, doesn't matter what it is. If it has an edge, it's because it is separated from me. It is begging to be acknowledged, held, healed, and integrated. Which is why in Islamic spirituality, we are asked not to avoid difficult feelings. It has lessons to teach us. Of course, as the mystics say, don't run towards difficult feelings. Don't run towards difficult feelings. Just don't run away from them. Embrace them. So there's a practice called sacred holding. Just bring it into you. Where do you feel it in your body? Be present with it. Ask it some questions. Breathe through it. There are several steps of this process where we acknowledge, touch, embrace, envelop with love this difficult feeling and integrate it. You know, Carl Jung, who studied many Eastern traditions, 
he had this saying that, Will you have the courage and the grace for once to kiss the demons and dragons within you? That is how they turn into a prince or princess. I love the saying of Rumi again, who uttered, Take a pickaxe, take a pickaxe and break open your stony heart. The heart's matrix is glutted with rubies. Springs of laughter are buried in your chest. Take a pickaxe and break open your stony heart. The heart's matrix is glutted with rubies. Springs of laughter are buried in your chest. My friends, just be with that for a few moments. And now, the five pillars. The most important one is that first pillar, which has two parts. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The first part is about God. There is no God but God. And how do you explain that? Well, let me use some Quranic verses. There's one Quranic verse that says, if all the trees in the universe became pens and all the seven oceans became ink and you began to write out the mystery of God and the oceans were depleted then replenished and you continued writing out the mysteries of God, you wouldn't come close to describing a fraction of the fraction of the fraction of God's mysteries. Which led Rumi to utter in these matters of the invisible world about God, he uttered, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. Sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. Again, be with that. The invisible world, God, total mystery. Another verse from the Quran. Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein. I repeat, Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein. In fact, in a very beautiful revelation that came to the Prophet Muhammad, Allah said, I cannot be contained in the space of the earth. I cannot be contained in the space of the heavens, but I can be contained in the space of the pure, loving heart. The Quran says Allah is Zahir and Batin, outside of you, but also inside of you. And this hadith says, inside the innermost chambers of your heart. And Allah, Spirit, Divinity, is always accessible. I love this true story of Rabia, again, in Iraq. She's walking the street and she came across this very famous master, a Sufi Sheikh, who outdoors was teaching his hundreds of adoring students and this uh, famous teacher was saying to the students, you know, Allah is so compassionate, so loving. If you keep on knocking on Allah's door, knocking, 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 one day out of compassion, Allah will open the door. And Rabia inter interjected and said, brother, to the master, she said, when was the door ever closed? And the teacher got up, turned towards her, and just bows to her. Let me take one more verse, a very important verse, because it has many multiple meanings. The Quran says, every so way you turn is the face of Allah. I repeat, every so where you turn is the face of Allah. Is my enemy also the face of Allah? Yes. How do you explain that? 
Well, again, the mystics explain, I might be against that person's behavior, which might be unacceptable, but I'm not against that person's being or essence, which is Christ nature, Elohim nature, Allah nature, Buddha nature, Krishna nature. Let me give a quotation from that 15th century Indian mystic Kabir, who is both a Muslim and a Hindu. And Kabir says, you know, or he said, when you meet somebody who is adversarial, protect yourself. Don't allow yourself to be abused. Take the right action. Ah, but he says, I implore you, as you take the right action, please do not keep this person's essence, person's divine spark out of your heart. And just keeping this in my mind and heart as I take the right action has the power to shift heaven and earth. One more insight, which is often asked, every so way you turn is the face of Allah. Is the devil, Satan also the face of Allah? The mystics say, yes, but Allah does not approve of the devil. What does that mean? I like Rumi's explanation. He says, listen to this. A doctor, a medical doctor, for his or her livelihood, needs for people to fall ill, to become sick. But does a doctor approve of them suffering? No. A baker needs for people to be hungry. But does a baker approve of them starving? No. Let me move on to the second part of the very first one. The first pillar. Muhammad Rasulullah. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. A very misunderstood verse because most non-Muslims, or not many non-Muslims, and certainly even some Muslims believe that Muhammad is the greater, greatest messenger of God. Absolutely untrue. In fact, there are many verses in the Quran that says that, O Muhammad, before you came, there were many prophets before you, and make no distinction between them. Another verse says, there's nothing revealed to you that has not been revealed to other apostles. So if a Muslim says that Muhammad is superior to all other prophets, this is very un-Quranic. In the Quran, the most mentioned prophet is actually Moses, who is called the voice through whom God spoke. Abraham is called the friend of God. Jesus is called the Spirit of God. Peace be upon all of them. And as I've mentioned the Prophet, I should mention the Quran mentions, besides the night of power, when the first verses of the Quran were revealed to humanity, I've talked about that, the Quran talks about another phenomenal spiritual experience of the Prophet. He was meditating in Mecca, and then he got very confused. Is this really happening or is it a vision? But he found himself being transported horizontally from Mecca to Jerusalem, where you have the Dome of the Rock there, the, the third holiest place in Islam, Jerusalem. And from there, he began to ascend seven levels of heaven, which popularizes that wonderful insight, I'm in seventh heaven. Now, and this has many, many meanings. Let me just give you one meaning of this, of this horizontal and vertical journey. It's about if you want to have a complete life, become a, become a more developed human being, a mature person, you have to work over a lifetime equally in the visible world 
and the invisible world. Satisfy your material needs in the bazaar of life. That's the horizontal part. And also nourish your soul. That's the vertical one. Okay, we'll move on. We'll go faster now. The second one is, the second pillar is prayer. Maybe you've seen Muslims pray. They'll go like this, they'll bow, they'll prostrate. Every movement has a meaning. This means as I stand in the presence of majesty, I'm putting the world for now behind me. Now, where did Muhammad get the idea of going like this, bowing, prostrating, saying some words? Ah, he got it in that spiritual experience, which I just mentioned, the night journey, seven levels of heaven. As the prophet was ascending seven levels of heaven, he was dazzled as he looked around by the sight of angels. And what were the angels doing? They were going like this, bowing, prostrating, and he began to listen to what they were saying, and he intuited they were praising God and thanking God. And from that, the Prophet Muhammad, he felt that an authentic prayer in imitation of angels needs to consist of praising God, thanking God, and using the gift of a body to express this adoration. So what are Muslims saying when they are bowing and prostrating? Praising God and thanking God. And this is different from supplication. You know, there's a verse in the Quran that says, bow in adoration and draw closer to God. And the mystics say, Meditate on this. One prostration of prayer to God liberates you from a thousand prostrations to your ego. One prostration of prayer to God liberates you from a thousand prostrations to your ego. There's a very famous story about prayer, about body prayer. It's allegorical. The mullah is in jail, imprisoned for life very upset but he becomes happy because he has heard that his teacher has permission to visit him why is he happy he's quite sure the teacher will slip in a weapon or a key to escape the teacher comes but gives him a prayer rug a lousy prayer rug and the the mullah pretends to be happy thanks and the, and the sheikh goes away and the mullah realizes he's got time on his hand. He spreads out the prayer rug and he starts, Allahu Akbar, Allah, you're the greatest of the greatest, the most compassionate, bows. And by the way, the, this gesture of bowing means I let go of my ego. He says, I'm very grateful to you, God. Doesn't mean a word and prostrates on the floor. And all the time he's wondering, of what use is this prayer rug, my prayers, regarding my condition. But as the days and weeks and months go by, he suddenly realizes there's a design in the prayer rug. He looks closely. It's a design of an escape route from the prison. You know, I've shown it to my Hindu friends, my, some of those who follow the Bhakti Yoga. They say this is all about devotion. To my Buddhist friends, they say it's about mindfulness. Bow in adoration and draw closer. One prostration of prayer to God liberates you from a thousand prostrations to your ego. And also I want to add, like the Hindus and Buddhists and other people from different traditions, Muslims love to repeat a mantra again and again. Uh, you know, in for example, in the Hindu uh, Bhakti Yoga, the words are, keep the name of your Lord spinning in the midst of all your activities. There's a story in Islam where a Bedouin goes to the Prophet Muhammad and says, Oh, sweet Muhammad, Islam has become too complicated for me. Just give me one spiritual practice. 
And the Prophet Muhammad said, of course, just do this. Do what? And the Prophet Muhammad said, keep your tongue forever moistened with the name of Allah. Keep your tongue forever moistened with the name of Allah. And why would this repetition of this sacred mantra work? And surprisingly, in all the different traditions, same metaphor, a vat or pot of dye, D-Y-E, color. Take a cloth, dip it into the vat of dye, take it out, it has a beautiful color, but it fades away over time. But what happens if you dip the cloth in the vat of dye again and again and again and again and again over time? It becomes color fast. It becomes permanent. There's a verse in the Quran that says, who has a better dye, D-Y-E, than God's? In, in the case of supplications, prayers of deep supplication, the Islamic mystics say, if it's for supplication, do it with increased necessity increased necessity it has to be a cry from the depth of your soul again the mystics say have you not noticed that only when a baby is born only when a baby is born does the mother's chest become filled with milk only when a baby is born does the mother's chest become filled with milk because there's an increased necessity for it Okay, just pause on that. I've got two more points to make. In the Quran, any verse about prayer is followed by a verse on service. And the Quran says if you are giving in service, it is meaningful. Number one, give freely, give freely of what you love. Number two, give to those who ask, cannot ask, or don't ask. Number three, give quietly, without any fanfare. This will atone for some of your misdeeds. Give for the sake of Allah. There are some amazing verses in the Quran which are used in the world of interfaith. But the Quran says, it doesn't matter what your gender is. It does not matter what your religion is. What takes you to heaven is having faith in God, but mostly doing righteous deeds. Why do I say mostly? Because this is repeated many, many times. The need to do righteous deeds. A very common story is, Jamal, on the day you die, on the day you die, Jamal, you'll have to leave your money, your titles at your palace. It's beautiful that you have wonderful family, relatives, friends, but they can accompany you only up to the gravesite. And what takes you beyond that is a record of your righteous deeds. You know, among the last words of Prophet Muhammad before he died, he said, do righteous deeds that will please your sustainer. The Quran also mentions that on the path of righteous deeds, it is important to climb the steep path. This is a very telling verse that says, God brought you to a forking of the road, to a steep incline, but Jamal, you did not climb the steep incline. And the Quran goes on to say, what can I tell you about the steep incline? And the number one is to free a slave from bondage. All the mystics say, it's wonderful you give, you're a being of service, but, but are you also engaged in making structural changes? Here's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad. 
Prophet Muhammad said, if you see injustice, cruelty, use your hands, do something, get engaged. If you cannot do that, use your mouth, speak out against that injustice. And if you cannot do that, yes, pray for that situation. But he added, in this instance, prayer is the weakest form of faith. For a daily life, the Prophet Muhammad in the area of service said, and he asked us to take this to heart, Allah says, do good deeds according to your capacity. God never tires of giving rewards unless you tire of doing good deeds. The good deeds, most loved by God, are the ones that are done regularly, no matter how small they are. So just be with that. The good deeds, most loved by God, are the ones that are done regularly, no matter how small they are. Okay, the fourth one, the fourth pillar, is actually about Ramadan, but essentially from a spiritual perspective, it's about gratitude. You see, Ramadan has two meanings. It's the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar. It's also the practice of fasting for self-purification from pre-sunrise to sunset. The question is, why do Muslims practice Ramadan in the month of Ramadan? Because, as I mentioned earlier, the first verses of the Quran were revealed in the month of Ramadan. So, to express gratitude, thankfulness, Muslims will commit themselves to entering into one whole month of self-purification because it was in that month the first verses of the Quran descended upon humanity. My favorite story about gratitude is that of the mullah who has lost his donkey. The mullah has lost his donkey. The entire village tries to find the donkey. The donkey is lost forever. They come in the evening to give mullah the bad news. And where's the mullah? He's in the town square on his knees saying, Allah, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful. They say, mullah, you haven't heard the bad news. Your donkey is lost forever. He says, I know, I know, I know, but I'm, but I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to God that I was not on the donkey. This is about giving thanks, expressing gratitude, even in times of affliction. All the great teachers from all traditions say, if you're doing that, you're giving thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. And the last one, Hajj, pilgrimage, but it's really about community from a spiritual perspective. The sages say even prophets needed companions. The Quran says, at a certain stage of your life, you will need a spiritual circle with whom you can consult and who gather together for the teaching of patience and truth. So all those different verses in the Quran about what Hindus and Buddhists might call Sangha is summarized in this wonderful utterance or poetry of Ibn Khafif who says this is what the Quran says about who comprises a member of your what is called in Islamic spirituality circle of love Rumi says please come out of the circle of time and enter the circle of love and Ibn Khafif says find someone the sight of whom reminds you of God, 
the awe of whom moves your heart. And is someone who counsels you, not with the tongue of words, but with the tongue of deeds. This summarizes the Quranic verses on, you might say, I guess what, what Easterners might say, right association. The sight of whom reminds you of God, the awe of whom moves your heart, and is someone who counsels you, not with the tongue of words, but with the tongue of deeds. And the Prophet Muhammad said, you need spiritual practices, but your spiritual practices are only as good as those of your close, closest friends. Therefore, choose your close friends wisely. With that, my friends, I'll end with one story which the Quran emphasizes on the subject of time. I have spoken and spoken and spoken, gone beyond my time. So here's a question, the, the, not question, it is a question, also a story about being, becoming aware of the preciousness of time. The Mullah is in London Museum and there's a very uh, scholarly, famous guide, a professor who says, this object uh, is a thousand years old. The Mullah raises his hand, sir, is 1,004 years old. The guide is annoyed. Second time, this is 50,000 years old. Excuse me, says the Mullah, 50,004 years old. Happens a third time, this is um, 100,000 years old. Mullah says, excuse me, it's 100,004 years old. Now the professor is quite annoyed. He says, sir, you have a beard, you have a, a turban. It tells me you're from the mysterious East. But how can you be so laser precise about these dates? The Mullah says, simple. I was here four years ago. At that time, you mentioned those dates. One of the many meanings of this story is, it's later than you think. For me, literally, it's later than I think. But I thank you so much for your time. Thank you.